This week on Thinking Biblically, I'm joined again by my dear friend, uh, fellow Jewish believer, Avner Bosky, from Beersheba, Beersheba in the south of Israel, and he will share an update as to what's going on there at this time. Welcome to Thinking Biblically. My name is Alan Gilman. Thinking Biblically is a podcast dedicated to exploring how all Scripture speaks to all of life. Well, Saturday morning, I woke up uh, to a report from my dear friend Avner Bosky sharing uh, what had started hours before in Israel, uh, which is now known to be the the worst uh, atrocity since the Holocaust. And so I reached out to Avner yesterday and asked him if he would uh, come on Thinking Biblically to to share his perspective as to what's going on, and he immediately agreed to do so. And um, I've already recorded it, and as you'll see, I was quite surprised by some of his answers to my questions, um, as he basically shares with us, enough is enough. So here's that interview now. Avner Bosky is no stranger to the Thinking Biblically podcast. He's originally from Montreal, Canada, as I am. Along with his wife, Rachel, he emigrated to Israel about 40 years ago, and the past 20 years they've lived in Beersheba in the south of the country. Through his writing and teaching, Avner provides a biblically-based and insightful, balanced view of God's heart for Israel and the Middle East. His books include Jews, Arabs, and the Middle East, A Messianic Perspective, and Israel, The Key to World Revival. Well, Avner, thank you so much for doing this amidst all that's happening. It's wonderful to be with you, Alan. As they say, no ref simches in Yiddish, only at happy times. Mm, May it be. So why don't we start with, can you walk us through uh, what it was like to wake up Saturday morning and, of course, help people understand where you actually are and what that means in the, with, with all this? Yeah, we're about 62 seconds away from Gaza by rocket fire. And um, so at 6.30, there was a rocket uh, siren. We got up, went downstairs immediately to yeah. our uh, shelter. Uh, and we thought, okay, that's just a rocket fire. There's stuff going on. You know, it happens from time to time. Uh, but within a little while, uh, we began, uh, became aware that there was an invasion going on. By 10 o'clock, it was all over the Gaza Strip. And the actual rocket fire was a strategic feint, F-E-I-N-T, a diversion, uh, in order to get 1,000 people crossing the uh, border. Combination of a cyber attack, probably through Iran, uh, blinded uh, the Israeli observer posts. And then uh, as well, you had um, Iranian trained people with paragliders uh, coming over the observation posts, dropping manual bombs on the posts. Very well organized. About 15 to 20 posts were taken out. And then all these motorcycles, pickup trucks, bulldozers came and a thousand Hamas terrorists came in. It's important for people to understand that Hamas is trained, supplied, and financed by Iran. Not only them, also Islamic Jihad in the Gaza Strip, and also Hezbollah in Lebanon, and also Syria doesn't do anything without Iran's say-so. So So Iran is developing to be one of the major power players, and a lot of what's going on here is because of the fact that they're unhappy with the Saudi uh, under-the-table discussions between Israel, Saudi, and America. So this is politics through war. Machiavelli talks about that principle. And uh, there's been talk for years that uh, there would be something from Gaza and then Lebanon would come in where Hezbollah has 150,000 uh, GPS guided rockets which could hit anywhere in Israel and uh, casualties on that would probably be 5,000 a day. So that's kind of what we're looking at. So when these uh, 1,000 people came in, we're talking actually the best term for Canadians to understand would be ISIS. There were pictures of ISIS in Syria what happened is they came in, and I just talked uh, for about an hour with a friend of mine whose home had been taken over by terrorists for about four hours, and he told me everything in great detail. Uh, what happened is they went in, they machine gunned families. 
uh, he came out of his house and saw his neighbor's two young daughters dead on the ground. Just a few minutes ago, they discovered 40 babies who had been slaughtered in Kfar Aza, uh, babies. And what happened then is they took people and either shot them. There was a trance party going on with about, I don't know how many people. They killed uh, many, many people, at least 250 people at a trance party, young people. And then what they did is they kidnapped people uh, on pickup trucks or forcing them to run across the border. You're talking about golden ages, 80-year-old women, uh, soldiers uh, that they had wounded, uh, little kids. And there are right now uh, on on video, unfortunately, I, I have not watched them, but uh, I have friends who have watched them, snuff videos of uh, women, young women being raped uh, repeatedly by lines of men, uh, children being tortured, uh, soldiers, Israeli soldiers being decapitated on film. Uh, so we're talking about something like ISIS going on. And uh, as I like to say, uh, Osama bin Laden is not a good neighbor. And that's what we're dealing with right now. And those who are demonstrating in Canada, if they have any idea of what's going on, they're very wicked people, but I would hope they're ignorant. But in any case, they're supporting something very much like what the Nazis did when they broke into Ukraine and Poland in World War II. Uh, 700, now it's gone up to 770 uh, Jews have been killed uh, on Saturday. That's uh, more than happened in all of Israel's wars any one day, and it only can be compared to the Holocaust in terms of that. Of course, in the Holocaust, it was even more. I don't know if you heard about the uh, the solidarity meeting held in Ottawa, where we live, uh, and uh, uh, my wife Robin and I and, and some of our adult children were there. And I have, I'm going to cry, I've never seen uh, a display of solidarity Um Whatever our our political views uh, about the current government might be, the prime minister was unequivocal in his support uh, for for Israel and his condemnation of those who um, support uh, Hamas and and what hap what is happening, as well as the uh, as well as these uh, celebrations in the street that have yes. occurred here in Canada and elsewhere. That was condemned okay. by him. And the leader of the opposition, who uh, who gave really really strong words with regard I'm really, to, I'm Hamas. really glad for that. Usually, what happens, uh, Alan, historically, is when Israel then begins to go after Hamas, uh, and uh, they have to go into civilian areas because Hamas bases its rockets and all its work uh, under civilian areas, mosques, schools, UN uh, institutions. And when Israel has to go in, then usually everything changes very quickly, and Israel is then condemned. Uh, and so yeah. uh, at this point, most people in Israel don't care too much about that anymore. Yeah, and, we'll, and we'll, I want to come back to that. Um, I appreciate the, the overview that, you know, we've been hearing this over and over again the past few days. We continue to hear, and too many people still are, are likely deaf to what's been going on. But could you take us into your personal thoughts when it began to dawn on you what was going on and you have you know you have family there um what was that like for you sure well one of my son's dear friends um who is a uh, a sound and stage producer for musical concerts he's got a young kid excellent sense of humor uh he was um uh, murdered uh by uh you know defending his kibbutz and his more probably one of those 40 babies is is his, who was found with dead. Um, it, um, it took a while to unfold, Alan. It wasn't like immediately understood um, because Hamas is usually operated based on a squad of four or, or maybe 10 or 20, but not a thousand. And um, the fact that the observer points were down meant we didn't get a good idea of what was happening. And when we did, uh, you're getting rockets coming at the same time. So it's it's it, it took a while. A lot of the dead, dead bodies have been found only yesterday and today. Uh, the people who have been kidnapped, which could be up to 150 people, maybe more, uh, still not sure. There's been a certain amount of fog of war going on. Uh, but uh, people realize this is not business as usual. This is not like previous times. Um, and... Um, Israel's been talking for 15 years ever since the uh, Lebanese war in 2005 or six, whenever it was. And um, 
and uh, that Hezbollah has been rearming and now has 150,000 uh, GPS guided uh, rockets, which could do great damage to Israel. And uh, there's been discussion on the uh, part of the Islamic Republic of Iran and other people about a strategic five front uh, attack on Israel. And uh, so, yeah, people are very sober here. Very, very, very sober. Yours uh, was the the how I first heard what was going on when I got up on Saturday morning. Um, it was your update that I saw. Um, and um, yeah, our hearts have been heavy uh, ever since, uh, of course. Um, are you are your how much of your families in Israel as we speak? Uh, two of our sons are here, one studying in Texas, in uh, Tennessee, and one's uh, uh, in uh, California. Okay, so they're not in the country at this time? Two, two are here and two are not. Here. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. And, and they no longer they no they no longer do reserve duty. So, uh, but like one of my sons was uh, five hundred meters away from a uh, a mass rocket which came down in one of the suburbs of uh, Jerusalem just a few days ago. My daughter in law was with her kids when a, um, a rocket alert went off. She had to stop the car, get into the car, pull the kids out of their car seats, and run into a shelter bomb shelter uh, so you know there's certain tensions certainly going on here at this time but everyone's safe currently yeah because we're not living in the gaza area or just like five minutes ago there were rockets raining down on tel aviv you know um so it's an exciting time but the thing is this biblically the concept of unfriendly neighbors who want to destroy us uh, you know, that's what Psalm 80 is about, and that's what uh, the period of the judge is about, and, and that's what David had to deal with in Psalm 118. So uh, the concepts of the end of days, specifically Psalm 83, if you look at the, the powers in Psalm 83 coming against Israel, they're exactly what's going on right now. So I'm not saying that Psalm 83 is being fully fulfilled right now, but it's, uh, it's a, certainly a poetic foreshadowing of what's going to happen. So you've already touched on uh, playing with my mute button here. Um, you've already touched this a, a little bit, but what do you think is going to happen next? Well, the Israeli army has uh, certain things it has to do, which they've announced as well. And that is one to totally clear out the 1,000 terrorists, more than that, who have come into Israel. That means going house to house on kibbutz and moshav and, and cities in that area literally engaging in hand-to-hand -hand combat with these people. Counter, uh, close, you know, what do they call it? Uh, urban, uh, uh, close in camp, close uh, urban uh, Urban fighting. warfare. Urban, yeah, yeah. And so that's kind of nearly finished, but not quite. They've uh, possibly killed up to a thousand Hamas terrorists, but there's still pockets here and there. Second thing is to evacuate from what's called the Gaza Envelope, uh, all those in the Kibbutzim and Moshavim, which Israel never did, and now they've done it, which clears the way. Also, there's about seven towns uh, on the Lebanese border that were uh, getting attacked by Islamic Jihad, which also has been given a home in Lebanon and, and some rocket fire against Israelis, removing them from right against the border. And then there will be an invasion of Gaza, and it will be uh, very, very strong. Uh, right now, 187,000 Gazans have moved out of the cities in response to Israel's call to get out of the cities. Because um, uh, Hamas not only fires rockets against civilians in Israel, but they fire it from civilian areas in Gaza. So to take them out involves having to hit civilian areas. Uh, Colonel Camp, who was the head of the British forces for NATO, spoke to him about this one time. And he said, there's no country like Israel in the world in terms of trying to limit civilian casualties. You, you wouldn't hear that on the news, but that's the fact. And so uh, Israel has to go in, and it's a very sticky thing. But uh, Hamas just said, we're not going to negotiate for any of the captives until all fighting is finished. So that means Israel has said, we're not going to, we're not going to hit our own hostages but uh, we are going to hit Hamas. What do you do with the uh, claim that Israel policy has contributed to the current situation? 
Well, you know, uh, it's kind of like saying Adam's uh, eating of the uh, tomato or whatever it was, an apple, is the cause of all our problems. In one sense, it's true. Israel exists. Therefore, according to the jihadi perspective, there are problems. And that's how they see it. And so Israel moved out, totally cleared out of Gaza, totally, 100%, no Jews, no Israelis, no soldiers, and gave everything back, gave all the uh, irrigation systems back when we withdrew between 2004 and 2006. Hamas destroyed all the infrastructure we gave them, and then they proceeded to develop it as an armed battleship base against Israel. People don't often understand what classical Islam in the Islamic sources says that jihad is the requirement and the obligation, one of the pillars of Islam. And that involves uh, crushing and enslaving or destroying those who will not accept Islam, including specifically the peoples of the book, which is Christians and Jews. And so to them, it's a, it's a macho thing uh, uh, theologically. But they need to win. They need to destroy us. And if we beat them, this means something's wrong with either Islamic behavior or potentially with the Islamic deity, so they must win. And says in the Quran about jihad, jihad involves killing and being killed. It's a culture. And so for them, they're not interested in negotiating and you don't negotiate with people who want to kill you. And it really is an all or nothing thing that the very existence of Israel is already like a slap in the face and the shame uh, of, of the establishment of the Jewish state in our ancient homeland is enough um, so, um, have you ever postulated if Israel has some other way of approaching this besides, um, going after, because like, it's an impossible situation. Gaza is a densely populated people. They have, uh, children, women and children embedded along with militants, um, in order for Israel to go in. Now, Israeli citizens are, are in Gaza, uh, yeah, I was along with this. So um, I believe I, I tried to look it up just before I, I uh, got online with you. But um, I believe our, despite our prime minister's unequivocal statement, then you get what's now called the Global Affairs Canada, our foreign ministry, saying talking about the need for both sides to de-escalate. Yeah, well, this is a total misunderstanding. It's like saying. Uh, let's de-escalate with Nazi Germany. And by the way, there were Canadians and Americans who really didn't want to fight Hitler. But Hitler is Hitler, and Hamas is Hamas. And those who talk about de-escalation, there's a quote from Golda Meir, you cannot negotiate peace with someone who has come to kill you. And uh, it's a foolishness. It's a blindness, and if it's not blindness, then it's evil. So that's my response to that. You do not negotiate with Osama bin Laden. It's as simple as that. And America didn't do that. In Canada in the end, did not negotiate with Hitler, although, as you may know, many American and Canadian industrialists did supply him prior to World War II. Yeah, but are we supposed to turn the other cheek? Well, of course, the answer is, how many cheeks do you have? Uh, uh, is that a trick question? Yeah, when Yeshua returns, he comes on a horse with a sword. Maybe he should turn the other cheek and come instead of a sword. Yeah, but that's when he returns. Avner, that's when he returns. What about now? Now we're supposed to behave ourselves. And, and, uh, well, and Romans 12 and, says that God gives a sword to the governments, which is supposed to defend and to achieve justice. And that was understood in the Holy Roman Empire more than it's understood in Canada today. So you're... Obviously, you're saying Israel's justified in doing this. Well, you know, if you look at Ezekiel 37, and you see when God takes the dry bones back to Israel, they don't have the spirit. And then he breathes on them. They come alive, and it says in Hebrew, they turn into chel gadol me'od mod, an army, a big one, much, much. They're a turn. God brings Israel back to become an army. This doesn't fit into most people's eschatology, just the same way the Bible doesn't fit into many people's eschatology. But it's a challenge that we need to be praying about. God brought us back to a very unfriendly neighborhood, and he knew that. So how do you, but you know, that of course doesn't uh, justify any kind of, uh, you know, military action. You know, if, if, according if you... To, according, to, according to who? Well, it doesn't justify any military action, which I don't believe Israel's necessarily going to do. Well, let, let me put it this way. If you had the opportunity to, 
to join uh, uh, the emergency cabinet and you it was your turn to advise um, from a biblical perspective what would you say to the leaders of Israel in this situation I would say that what Joshua did in the city of Jericho is the model it's a biblical model although many pacifist Christians don't like it but it's still in the Bible and God told them to do that you know that whole thing where Joshua meets the captain of the Lord's hosts there of his armies Joshua says, whose side do you want? And I've heard so many preachers go to that. But the answer is, Joshua is on his side, and Joshua was commissioned by him to destroy Jericho. You know, Dresden is one example of what happened in World War II. And I don't think too many people in World War II said, we're so worried about innocent Germans, because it was an understanding that Hitler was backed up by the German people. Very few were against him. And there were like the White Rose, and there was like Bonhoeffer. But most of the people in the Wehrmacht were fighting for Hitler. And so there wasn't a question in, in World War II with Canadian soldiers fighting against Germans, oh, we're really, really afraid of hurting innocent Germans, because there was a war machine, and the goal was to destroy Canada, you know, and the Jews. And so that's the same thing here. This concept of you can have a war... Uh, by video game, where no one gets hurt? No, that's not what the Bible says. That's not what David was. He was a man of war. And Exodus 15 says Yahweh is a man of war. So maybe we need to get back to look at how the Jewish people handled themselves in the Middle East and see what's going to happen, because that's what it says in Ezekiel 25. God's going to judge Edom through Israel. Yeah, so the I, I'm assuming a lot of people would be quite uncomfortable with this kind of talk, partly because we don't talk this way. You know, I don't the, mind if people are uncomfortable. I would rather them be uncomfortable and our enemies be destroyed. Because the opposite is not something that I and my children want to live with. And again, during World War II, a lot of people wanted to compromise with Hitler. I understand that. Um, could you explain a little bit, um, just some f further context? Because um, it, it almost sounds like Israel's just pure aggressor now in, in reaction to what's going on, when actually Israel has been an emissary of peace in the region more than any other people group. Can, can you give a little bit of that context for people that may not be aware of it? Sure. Uh, most Canadians don't understand the Middle East at all. They're kind of in a Lester Pearson uh, mode, he and his dog, and his occult gatherings. Uh, the Russians in Beirut had one of their diplomats captured. So what did they do? They got the top people who were fighting against them from the Shiite community, cut off their testicles, and sent them in a box to the heads of the Shiites. And within about five hours, their diplomat was released. That is the language that the Middle East understands. And it's not a language that Canada understands. And uh, Israel has been trying to fight wars based on Western values, and that doesn't work in the Middle East. Are you rec would you recommend that the Russian model, if you had an opportunity to uh, speak to uh, the... May I, may I suggest something? That the line of questioning that you're bringing up is a fearful, pacifistic line of questioning that doesn't fit who King David was in the Bible. So my model is King David. My model is not what the CBC will say. But Avner, as you know, so many Bible believers think that with the coming of Yeshua, we all are supposed to calm down and be nice to each other. No one says don't be nice to each other. It says love your enemies and pray for them, but sometimes you have to kill them too. Ouch. This is what happened in World War II. Do you remember in that movie, was it Saving Private Ryan, the sniper, the believer, who prays before he shoots? I did see it once. Uh, often my, my movie scene memory doesn't work very well. Yeah, I mean, back when, when Soviet Union was considered an enemy, you know, people understood the Cold War a little better. Now that's, I say, it's old hat. But it's not old hat in the Middle East, and it's not old hat in Israel, and it's certainly not old hat for those who believe jihad. Can we recognize and discern who our enemy is and what they want to do? They're not open to discussion. 
I'm, I'm hearing a bit of enough is enough coming from you uh, this well, morning. Well, that's the our case, time. isn't it? That's mm -hmm. the case. That's the case. When Germans marched into Ukraine and slaughtered Jews, when is it enough? Good question. Wow. And those okay. who defend Nazis are fellow travelers. Okay. So you don't even want to talk about the fact that Israel has done everything it 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 can and o and o over done more than anything that people would expect in, in trying to be nice to the surrounding aggressors. No, that's true. I agree with you 100% and I can talk for a long time on that issue. But, you know, it says in Ecclesiastes, there's a time for peace and a time for war. This is a time for war. So I'm not interested so much in doing propaganda that's saying we Jews are really nice people. We give oranges to people. We make chocolates. We have wonderful music. We've been so nice to Arabs. Some of our best friends are Arabs. That's not working right now in this area here. Wow. Okay. Do you want to speak more? You've, you've touched on, you know, I have these questions and you, you keep you keep jumping to further questions down my list before I get there, um, but um, which is fine. Um, you know, I, I, I wanted you to do this because you're a smart guy and I like you a lot, but um, you've already touched a bit on, on biblical con uh, context. How do you put this in a biblical context? You mentioned uh, Psalm 83, you've mentioned Ezekiel. Is there any more that you have to say in helping people understand this from a biblical perspective? Yeah, it says, you know, that all the nations are going to come up against Jerusalem to fight it. That's in Zechariah 12 through 14. And it talks about in 12, 1 through 10, about how the Jewish people are going to be a huge, powerful army and they're going to defeat their enemies. But also, there are other passages like uh, uh, 14, 1 and 2 in Zech Zechariah, which talk about the fact that there's going to be defeat for Israel as well. It's kind of like, which Messiah do we follow? The one who comes to die or the one who is resurrected and comes back conquering? The answer is yes. And so the same thing is true with the Jewish people. Uh, and, and we are in a process of getting returned. Ezekiel 37 says, without the Holy Spirit, but by the Holy Spirit. God is returning us to our land in unbelief. It's his doing. And then he's going to put his spirit in us, and that's his doing. And then we're going to become a great and mighty army, and that's his doing as well. People say, well, how can God do that for the Jews? I said, well, that's grace. Grace is unmerited favor. We supposedly believe that as Christians. Can God do that with the Jewish people? Yes, he can. He prophesies about it. Do we believe it? And are we lining up with the word about what's happening right now? So um, currently, the situation looks pretty dismal. How do, how do you deal with, cope with the Bible saying, he who keeps Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps? And here we are back in our ancient homeland, about half the Jewish world is in Israel today. Uh, we forget what kind of miracle that really is. And yet, this was the, the, worst, uh, the worst atrocities since the Holocaust. You know, one of the interesting things, Yeshua talks to the centurion as a military man in Luke, and he says, I have not found anyone like this with so much faith in all of Israel. You can imagine the apostles, Jewish guys, saying he's saying that a Roman centurion has more faith than a Jewish apostle? How can that be? And I think understanding what goes on in the military and soldiers and those who are military who are listening to me understand military train for war they train as Patton said don't i don't want to hear anyone saying you die for your country let the other son of a gun die for his country i don't think he said it that way but he changed the word we're talking about military we're talking about fighting most of us have never killed an animal but we eat hamburgers most of us Love the fact that David's a fighter, but we've never picked up a gun. And so there's a huge disconnect between us and the worldview of the Bible. You know, it says in Psalm 44:10, those who hate us have taken spoil for themselves. What do you do if it's your daughter who's getting raped 
um, repeatedly by a crowd of terrorists and it's getting filmed and broadcast around the world. What do you do if it's your son who's a soldier is getting his head cut off um, you know, by a Hamas guy with a huge uh, Arabian sword? How would you respond? You know, we, we pray for them, pray for their repentance by all means, as I'm trying to take them out. And I think we have to, we have to be realistic because uh, those who are compassionate to the cruel end up being cruel to the compassionate, it says in the Talmud. Well, you've touched on, again, a question coming up. How, so how shall we pray? Well, there's always three ways to pray for the Jewish people. The first is that they would come to know the Messiah, who is uh, the uh, Ancient of Days, and the captain of the Lord's armies. So there's a little military aspect that most believers don't remember there. But yes, for the salvation of Israel and the protection of Israel, first point. The second point on a three-legged stool is to go out, like it says in Romans 1.16, and share the message of the atoning power of Messiah with the Jewish people. Romans 1.16 says we're supposed to do that with priority to the Jewish people first. And the third thing is there's coming a time when most Canadians are going to turn against the Jews and most of the world. And we need to be ready to extend even our lives, like Cory ten Boom in World War II in the hiding place, to help them. So those are three things to do right now. And, and the prayer points part? To, well, first of all, praying for their salvation. That was the first point. You must have yep. missed it. The second part is to reach out with the gospel. That's evangelism. That's not instead of prayer. That's as well as prayer. And the third point of trying to help and save people, you need prayer and guidance from God as you do that too. Are there practical ways that people could help? Um, I'm, oh, my script. I'll try that question again because uh, sharing Yeshua with, with, um, with our people is practical. Um, but with people currently suffering, um, are there ways that people can help to, to alleviate that, practical things that they could do? Yes, I think two things. There are uh, many organizations working to help. Two of them who are actually developed funds to help uh, victims of terrorism right now. One of them is chosenpeople.org. One word, chosenpeople, no capitals.org. They have a fund to help. The other one is mda.org. I'll repeat it, MDA, that's Magen David Adom, Red Jewish Star of David. The Red Cross doesn't recognize the Jewish star. So uh, this would be like the Jewish Red Cross, but Jews don't tend to use a, a Red Cross. It has crusader connotations for us. So MDA.org or chosenpeople.org, you can donate online to both of them. And they have funds set up now to help people. So uh, we've been in touch uh, recently about uh, your coming to Ottawa as part of your upcoming North American trip. Uh, how is that looking, or is it too early to say anything about it's it? It's too early to say. You know, if uh, the Israeli government and Hamas would agree to end their war within a few days, it doesn't look like there'll be, be any problems, but they're not asking me. And uh, my concern is far more that we prosecute this war the right way so that it doesn't be like in Dr. It Hook, the movie where he comes back for generation to generation against uh, Peter and his family. So pray for us, pray that God will bring a successful prosecution of the war and a speedy one so that uh, we can come and visit in Canada. We're supposed to be there in the beginning, in the beginning of November. Right, and were you, were you just coming, what what are your plans to come to North America if you can share? Well, I don't, I don't share all my plans with everybody, only with my <laughs> wife. But we're going to be in Montreal. I have family. We're going to be in Ottawa speaking uh, twice, then down in the States the rest of the time. Okay. Yeah, so um, I'm hopefully going to be involved in the in November 5th, uh, Sunday evening, when you're due to be here, and we're going to pray that that actually does happen. Um, I'll be sharing that with, with folks um, as, as able. Well... I really didn't think it was going. You, it was going to be as as your words were going to be as strong as they were this morning. You you took me by surprise. Well, that's where we are, and that's the Middle East. Welcome to our uh, uh, I won't say our nightmare, but welcome to our situation. And God has decided that the Jewish people belong right in the center there, and that He's going to rule from Jerusalem 
uh, with the Jewish people as his servants doing that? Uh, yeah, so I, I think it's so important for people to wake up and see the seriousness of the situation. Um, I've been encouraging, try to encourage people to avoid uh, political speculations as to why, what, and the other things going on with various countries and 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 so on. But I I read a piece by a a, a young friend this morning uh, where he was he was saying um, this is what decolonization actually looks like, folks. All the nice talk that's going around, and and we constantly have here in Canada these these uh, land acknowledgments and all the rest. And and he was saying. You want to see where this stuff leads? Look what happened in Israel this past weekend. This is this some of this ambi pamby virtue signaling stuff that's become so popular. This leads to the slaughter of innocent lives. It's time yes, to wake up. Biblically, land reclamation is the Jewish people coming to their biblical land. By the way, yeah, which there too, if people only understood the facts on the ground about that, they would be astounded. It's not like anything that that. It's, that's part of our it, job. Yeah, it is that's part of our part. job, and uh, maybe I'll cover that. I'll cover that soon for folks. Well, Avner, I love you, and our hearts go to to you and your your family. And um, we do pray that there would be a, a just end of these uh, horrific events soon. I always pray that it be just and with as little blood as possible. Yeah. Well. Thanks for challenging me. I was just trying to play angel's advocate uh, with some of my questions, but um, as I said, I was quite surprised and thoroughly challenged, as I'm sure our viewers will be. Um, how can people contact you? Very easy. Just go to our website, which is www.davidstent.org. Very good. I'll put the, all the various links in the description um, and um, hopefully we'll see you soon and others can Man. come and see you as well. Thank you for the time. It's always a pleasure to be with you, and I tried not to make you laugh too much this time. Yeah, yeah, I think you did a pretty good job at that. Well, for him who has ears to hear, frankly, I didn't expect some of Avner's answers to my questions. Uh, some of my, my questions were... I was trying to get him to respond to some of the common things that some people are thinking and saying. I didn't expect him to respond um, in, the, in the way he did in terms of what I, I referred to the this enough is enough response, which I think I get. I, I personally, I don't, I don't like violence. I don't like anybody getting hurt. And there's a part of me emotionally that would just love to yell, you know, just stop, and and everybody, everybody, and everything would just calm down, and, and people would be nice to each other. And I've had a really hard time in 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 life grappling with the reality of evil, and that it is necessary and godly to take a stand against evil. And this is what Israel is facing. I, I wanted Avner to share with everybody because I, I know so many people still don't fully understand all the all the things that Israel's done to work for peace and how th their neighbors have have dug in their heels time and time again. And if anyone's interested in some of the information, contact me and I'll I'll try to point you in, in the right direction for that. But Avner didn't even want to talk about that. Uh, It's so sad that Bible believers don't reckon with the fact that the Bible is Israel's title deed. And by divine right, he's given us that land. And if, if you took the time to understand how the, the resettling of originally mandatory Palestine with Jewish people coming and all the things that happened that brought to the birth of the state in, in, in 1948. It's just such a remarkable story. 
and it, and Avner was right. And I don't I don't know how how anyone could speak for all Muslims or all Arab peoples. That's not the point. A group like Hamas and and others. Just read the uh, the uh, the Hamas charter. There is no compromise. There's no live and let live. The only option is the is the destruction of. Uh, of the Jewish state. And that means, that's not a political statement. That means the people that are there. And what we've seen this past weekend is evil showing its true colors. And I, I wish we could just be nice and have a nice solution, but evil, evil doesn't play the game that way. And we... We people who prefer nice need to understand that that God doesn't always prefer nice either. I've I've quote unquote liked to say and help people understand that God Himself isn't nice. God is good, and sometimes good demands uh, harsh responses. We should be loving, we should be kind, we should be lovers of peace. But there is a time to take a stand, and sometimes that stand needs to be harsh. May God bring a, a quick resolution, and may as few people as possible be hurt in the process. But I would ask people to pray that that, that justice would prevail and that this constant threat that that Israel, and that's Jews, Arabs, and others living in the land of Israel, that this, this threat of evil would, would be put to an end. And that, pray, that people making serious, serious decisions this time would be guided by, by, by God, whether they know Him or not. And do be praying for the salvation of, of, of the Jewish people through our Messiah. Pray for us. Um, also, um, if you haven't done so, if you have Jewish friends, Jewish family members, as many people do, and you haven't done this yet, please reach out to them. Many of our people feel very alone in these times, uh, and just sending a, an, an email or a text or a phone call we're seeing somebody in person, of course, and ask them, how are you doing? And they will likely know what you're talking about without explaining. And then let them let them talk. Let them share their hearts. Ask them if there's anything that you can do. I received a phone call yesterday and an email from someone. It was so, so touching uh, just to know that we're being remembered in this way. I will put the links to the organizations that Avner mentioned, as well as his uh, website in the in the description. Also, if you want to contact me, as always, you can do so at comments at thinkingbiblically.org. And I also want to encourage people to share this far and wide uh, to people who need to hear it. And uh, we'll be following this uh, this situation um, and. Um, you know, and see where we go from here. There's a there's a, a statement and a song that is sung, um, especially at times like this, where we sing "Am Yisrael Chai Odavinu Chai." The people of Israel live. Still, yet our Father lives. And among our people, there are some who believe in God, there are some who believe in Yeshua, as we do, many do not. But that doesn't change the fact that the people of Israel live because our Father in Heaven lives. He is the one who has seen us through and He will see us through again. And for those of us who who believe God's Word, the Scriptures, know that it's, it's often we survive through the fire, and that's the time that we're in. So thank you for watching or listening and um, look forward to 
connecting with, with you all another time soon. So this is Alan Gilman with Thinking Biblically. Thinking Biblically.